Well, indeed. Hello. Good to be here. What is my fifth Digital Summit? And welcome to your first, Eric. Yes. And exactly what the first time in Estonia at all, right? Yes. You guys have been punching above your weight since 2005. <laughs> all right. And you know why? Because I wrote it in my first book. <laughs> Estonia figured this out faster than anybody else in e-government. And I like the country so much, I've recently invested in one of your companies, Guard Time. You can is, keep doing so. Yeah. Yes, and, <laughs> and I intend to do more. Right. Guard Time will present later this afternoon. They're, they're basically, a, a think of it as they secure data yeah. right, on, on your network. But I mean, um, look, we digital summits sort of go by the times of uh, what are around. They also change the themes, but there are some themes that keep recurring. We started a few years back all the way from AI, and now it's sort of in the sphere of trusted connectivity. But I mean, AI obviously will have play a lot of parts of the future, and trusted connectivity also has to fit into the future context. So, so perhaps a good way to, for us to start is to say, hey, well, what is your take on where do things really stand with AI today? I mean, where are we? Well, first place, the trusted connectivity work that your, your prime minister, this team is doing is incredibly important. It was also important 10 years from now, and it will be important in the next 10 years, 20 years. And it's easy to understand why. I used to give the speech where if you don't like the internet, turn it off, <laughs> right? You, you know, you don't actually have to be on the internet. And the problem is that that is no longer true. Now our society requires the internet. You cannot get your job, your social right. life, your education without access to the internet for many reasons, including the pandemic. And so if we start from the trust thing, right, this, the internet, and I've been involved with it essentially my whole life, was not designed to be particularly trustworthy. It was particularly designed to be permissive. Right. And the trust, and in particular, the much more sophisticated security architectures were added later. And that's why we're still struggling with this, although things are much better. Right. Now, with AI, you have a similar process where AI is being invented now. And uh, you can think about AI in a series of phases. First, you had the original ideas about AI, which were in the 1950s. Yeah. They thought that basically in 1957, there was an article that said that we would have human consciousness in computers within a decade. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, when I was a graduate student, people were working on AI and symbolic reasoning where they were going to be able to describe the structure of language and knowledge in a mathematical proof. This is not dissimilar from Spinoza's work. Yeah. That didn't work either. And then you had deep learning as we know it now, which is uh, the technical term is called gradient descent. And this technique seems to work. And it allows to, you to do very deep analysis of information. So that's interesting. And that analysis allows us to, for example, have cars that can be driven by computers better than humans, better doctor diagnoses because of vision and those sorts of things. Um, but the real problem is the inverse is true. All right. That you can also generate data, and how do you know what the, gen the data that's generated is? But I mean, but let's, let's continue on that then. So if that's the sort of state of play, right? And it only will be progressing. I know that you are very sort of, in a way, both optimistic and, and sort of mm -hmm. cautious about the future streams. How can we have this trust in AI at all as part of trusted connectivity, right? I mean, uh, it's a big question. But. Well, first place, I don't think you should trust it today. Sure. Because it makes mistakes. Um, and there, there's this somehow we're, we're all watching movies and we're thinking we're building killer robots that can perfectly decide how to kill the wrong person. And then the female scientist kills the killer robot and the movie ends, <laughs> right? Which is a great movie. We're not doing that just so we're clear. We're not doing any of that. Mm -hmm. The core problem with AI is we don't fully understand how these algorithms work. We cannot prove their failure modes, their brittleness. Now, there are people working on all these things. Sure. So, so the, the way to understand AI today is you should not use it as the primary determinant in a life-critical decision, right? Basically involving medicine, mm -hmm. anything involving people, Right, obviously conflict. You, you want to have a human judge. It's people in policy often speak like high-risk situations or, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and the, in the largely failed European attempt to regulate this, Europeans use this term critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure can't use AI if it can't explain itself. Well, trust me, 
AI cannot explain itself, so you can't use it in critical infrastructure. We'll get back to the regulator, regulation and I guess Europeans okay. as well, but I mean, but still, if, if I tease you a bit, can, can you envision a trusted AI possible? There are the problems like you outlined, but I mean, yeah. is, it, is it doable at all, possibly? Um, it is to the degree that you still trust humans. Sure. Um, in other that, words, that's a, that's a big hurdle. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so the first place is we're going to get to the point where AI systems can do human level decision making and behavior because we can train them based on human behavior and we can do that pretty accurately. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure that we'll get to the point where we can accurately mimic human behavior. I'm also quite sure that we'll be able to understand the failure modes. Mm -hmm. right? The real problem is that people, that computers are very binary, they're very analytical, and people are not. And so you expect the computer to never make a mistake, whereas you accept that humans make mistakes because we're humans. And so that gap, it's the old thing of, um, with self-driving cars, self, I'll use the US numbers, uh, 35,000 people die on the streets of the United States every year, and those are obviously unintended and terrible things. Um, let's say we could cut that in half, right? That would be right. a big right. improvement. Well, the first uh, AI driving death was uh, a Tesla car, which went underneath, yes. uh, you remember all of this, the most interesting thing is that that was a front page article on the news, and yet there were 98 other deaths that day that were obviously equally tragic. So we've got to decide how we want to treat this. Is it sort of occupying the human space? Does it have an, a special expectation? And it gets worse because of the compression of time. I'll mm -hmm. give you my, my simplest example. Um, War will be conducted, and I, I worked for the U.S. military for a long time, so I've studied this at some length. War will be, con will be continued with quicker and quicker reaction times. So what happens when the attack occurs in cyber faster than a human can decide? Right. You need an automatic defensive back attacker. But how do you know the automatic offensive back attacker is attacking the right thing? You don't. Mm -hmm. So the conundrum is that when there's no time, you require extremely accurate systems. But in that sense, um, I still want to tease you on that one, but do you see, how far off do you see that? The accuracy of that being possible or? I, I don't think we know. I don't, okay. think, I don't think we know, but I think it's going to be a, it's, it is going to be a continual problem. There's evidence that with more training data, mm -hmm. you can get more and more accurate systems but there's no known standard to apply this. What is the error rate, if you will? But I think you have also said multiple times uh, that, that, that but you see this as a definite direction, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you don't know the specific timeline, it will happen yeah. because... But the thing that I'm talking about here is the arrival of broader AI services. So how do you use AI today? Uh, do you use a recommendation engine? Yes, you do. Uh, do you use social media? They all use AI to determine what feeds to give you. Do you ever click on an ad? I hope you click on Google ads. Those are selected with AI assistance. Um, there are so many examples, automatic translation. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you want to translate from one language to yeah. another. Uh, the translation now is pr pretty close to human level. That's mm -hmm. all AI. Those are in your use today. Um, the ones that are coming in the short term that are really interesting are all in biology and in chemistry, right. where people are using these techniques to solve very hard problems. And then the hottest thing are called lar la large language models, where you basically can build systems which you can converse with. Mm -hmm. And that's the next big area. Mm -hmm. But so if, if that is coming, then um, you already hinted that perhaps regulation, at least in some parts of the world, is inadequate now. What, what do you see as the bigger sort of regulatory space? Is, is enough happening or is it happening in the wrong direction, like you said? Well, I, I, I'm going to sound like a, an obnoxious American, which I am, so I apologize. <laughs> you can be today, right? Yes, but, but it's better to be truthful, and I am an obnoxious American. Um, the core issue here is the regulator's title is regulation as opposed to regulation and growth. So I was asked by the U.S. Congress to create a National Security Commission on AI, and we were asked, what are the areas of investment, growth, what does the private sector need to do, mm -hmm. and are there any regulatory issues, and then what are the national security concerns? 
and we've produced a report which is 800 pages long, which you can read uh, in your spare time. It's nscai.gov. And we really looked at this very, very thoroughly. Right. What does it take? And by the way, the answer is mostly investment in human capital, mostly investment in uh, high skills immigration into the United States in our case, working very closely with our partners, working on these algorithms. It's stuff that you would imagine with great detail. Right. And that has become a basis for many of the laws coming in America. In Europe, mm -hmm. You, it doesn't operate that way. You didn't have a how do we win at AI and also regulate it. You just had the regulatory thing. So, a, so Europe is in danger of not staying at the state of the art where the UK and the US and China are competing and partnering. And so the, the cost of an early regulation without also promotion could be very high. So let's, let's use an example of Estonia. Mm -hmm. You basically help build this. Um, there's every reason to think that Estonia should be a great leader in AI. You have everything that you need, right? And, and furthermore, as, as you, you and I have discussed and as the president of the European Union talked about, there's, there's these digital strategies where they're getting the data in one place, which yes. is what you need, yes. right? So where is the activity? And the answer is there's not enough people working on this. There's not enough money, there's not enough companies, and that has to get fixed. And that echoes basically the recommendation you made to the states as well, right? I mean, skillless people and so forth. But so and, and by the way, I should say that one of the things that I understand about the, the people who do this is that they're totally wacky. These are mathematicians and physicists and so forth who I understand very little of what they do, and I have a PhD in the area. <laughs> That's how advanced this stuff is. This is not normal programming and the kind of stuff that, that I could do today. I can't physically do it myself. Um, that's where the great insights are. And a lot of people are coming out of math and physics to work on this because it's so sexy. It's so powerful when you can actually pull these things off. I'll jump back to regulation, but, but now you prompted me to ask, obviously, well, a lot of those engineers, scientists, brightest people are obviously with big companies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are, what are companies doing to actually keep the things that they build at least somehow trusted on, and what can they do more? Well, so the... the if you asked me this five years ago, I right. would have proudly said, Google has dominated the space because the combination of Google Brain and DeepMind is really driving the industry forward. Mm -hmm. And I would have grudgingly agreed to Facebook and a few other companies as well. You were also more involved then. That's right. <laughs> but the important point is, I think the big companies really put their money in it. And the reason the digital companies did this is they got immediate revenue gains from it. Using AI, for example, to do ad selection, click selection, basically recommendations directly improves the revenue and you have lots of training data and it's all in one company. So it makes sense that's where. What's interesting in the last five years is the potential has become so great that the capital markets are funding startups at a level that is mind boggling. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. There's a number of startups that have spun out of Google where, which have 10 people that have started off with a valuation of two or $300 million. They have no assets, they just have the people. They anticipate their funding rounds at a billion dollars. Yeah. That's how big these markets are. Where are the European companies? They're not playing. Um, uh, I'm a, the large language models, there's a private company, which I'm a small investor in, that looks like its next valuation will be around a billion dollars, and they're playing at the level of Microsoft, Facebook, and mm -hmm. so forth. So it's true that it started off in the big companies, but there's so much money and there's so many clever people that the startups are there too. Uh, in Europe, because you don't have the large companies that are leading, you should have the large startups and you can get the money. Before I come with the next question, be ready with yours, because in one or two, we get to all the questions from the audience as well. But you put yourself you yourself put yourself the hat of obnoxious American on, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you see and hope uh, the American regulation is going and exactly you are quite sort of, you know, strong about sort of a European way, can there be a recoupling at all? Recoupling as it was said today, right? Well, there needs, there needs to be because I think that the Russian aggression in Ukraine reminds us that it's better to be in a democracy even if we complain all day about it. Sure. Um, when I tra and I've traveled all over the world, as many of you have, everyone complains about their government. 
But I would rather be in a democracy than in the alternatives. Um, I've recently been talking to my Chinese friends. They're complaining about China. You can imagine what people are saying in Russia if they could actually speak. It's just horrific. So let's start with a strong endorsement around free speech, democracy, democratic principles, liberal democracy, all the, the things, all the things that, uh, frankly, I think, uh, largely invented in Europe mm -hmm. over the years. And so with that as a statement, we're not going to win against China unless we have very strong transatlantic partnerships. Now, why do I say that? It's a math problem. China is very well run in this area. Mm -hmm. They understand precisely what markets they're in. Um, AI, quantum, synthetic biology, and new energy, where they're, by the way, 90% of the market share for all the stuff that you're going to use for electronic vehicles and basically renewable renewable energy, and in, um, they're obviously already ahead in 5G. It would be very hard to catch up with them in 5G, and they're ahead in financial services. It's going to be very hard to catch up with them in there. Maybe possible, we'll see. So you've got a, a country which has all sorts of problems, and they're doubling down in the core area. Mm -hmm. And why does that matter? They have four times as many uh, STEM graduates, and they have very liberal policies with respect to governments, with respect to money going to firms, and then they have a concept called civil military fusion, where the firms do both the military work and the commercial work. And the way the Chinese system works is they have the competi domestic competition, yes. and then they pick global winner. They pick a winner. And that's a numbers game too, right? right? Numbers game. And again, that's very different from the Western system. So I'm not suggesting we adopt their approaches. What I'm suggesting is that we do what we do best. Now mm -hmm. let's take a look, let's look at the at the pandemic, sure. BioNTech in Germany and Pfizer. Yeah. Um, and then let's look at Moderna, right, and so forth. The US government, as an example, created Operation Warp Speed, guaranteed the revenue of these firms along with many others that didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, you had the capital, the capital markets raised billions of dollars to make these things, and the universities helped in invent mRNA vaccines. That's when we work together. That's when we get the best. What do governments do? They create the necessary conditions for the market, and if necessary, they do pre-market com uh, commitments to get the market going. The capital, lots of companies lost money mm -hmm. in making vaccines, and that was a legitimate business risk that the capital markets provided. And of course, the universities did a fantastic job. That's how we win. We need to do that in this case as well. But using your analogy of COVID, then, it must be the thing that perhaps the sense of urgency or the burning platform sense is not there yet, or? Right. Well, let's I'll give you an example. Let's imagine that China invented, and I don't know if they're going to do this, um, invented a kind of AI that one, they wouldn't share, and two, was smarter than the kinds we're using. Mm -hmm. Let's just imagine that. How would you feel? You'd be pretty worried because that kind of AI could be used to advance material science, chemistry, warfare, conflict, social cohesion, in their case, social control, right? I wouldn't want that to happen. I'd want it to be invented in the West. Now, would I like it to be invented in the UK, US, Estonia? Any of those are acceptable because we're all under the same legal principles, in my view. And even the same sort of value base, if you wish. But, uh but, and I think you've been very vocal in saying, well, even your book, The Age of AI, right, with, with a few co-authors, that, look, AI will penetrate all aspects of our lives. We, we have to be ready and, and, and realistic about that, right? So at the age of 99, <clears throat> Dr. Kissinger decided that he wanted to write a book about the impact of AI on society. And mm -hmm. he had studied Kant. That was two years ago, three yes, years ago, right? Exactly. Yeah. It came out this year. He, um, and he had studied Kant before we were all alive, mm -hmm. right? So he can explain in his, in his sort of German accent how, how our perception of reality is important to us. And I will paraphrase his mm -hmm. writing and work by saying he's worried that when you have an AI system that can actually affect the information space and how we perceive truth, he says it's an ethical change. It's a change similar to that of the Reformation, which none of us were around for. Mm -hmm. And as you remember, in the, in, a, in the Reformation, the idea was instead of having truth delivered by your personal relationship with God, you could actually have truth developed by reason. Mm -hmm. right? The process of reasoning was developed during that period, maybe 400 years ago. So he believes that the arrival of these new AIs will change the way we perceive truth. Right. That's a very big deal. 
And um, my political friends spend all day complaining about social media because they're voters who is the currency of their job mm -hmm. actually believe falsehoods because they've been fed it by social media. That's an unintended consequence. So not intended, but mm -hmm. an unintended consequence of wiring everybody up together, right? And I don't want us to have the same experience with AI where we build all these incredibly powerful tools and then they get misused. I'll give you a simple example that anything that can be analyzed can be generated. So if you can analyze signals, if you can an analyze yes. a picture, you can generate it. If you want to look at something interesting, the hottest one this week is, an area, is a company called Stable Diffusion, and they are producing pictures that are better looking than real pictures. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, look it up. You'll see. But let's turn a chance to the audience. I mean, it's a rare opportunity, and I know that you actually love and adore yeah, Q&A sessions. So, starting from the minister, happy birthday. And can we get a mic here? Yes, minister. Yeah, hello, Christian. Uh, nice to have you here. Um, so, my question is about AI regulation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, so, to start off, AI, AI is still technically isn't that... Um, old, we don't see all the consequences that, uh, that will come. So if you have a PhD in the field and even you have a hard time grasping what's going on, uh, how much faith do you have that politicians will regulate in a good way uh, AI? And uh, if that regulation is needed, where would be the first steps uh, in regulating AI? So, so I'd like to go back in my obnoxious American role with great respect to what you have done and to be obnoxious. The problem here is you're asking a regulation question as a, instead of a how do I win question. I want Estonia to win. The best way to win is to get high skills immigration plus the local talent, which I know to be excellent, to form the companies to get the capital to solve these things. And then when they invent something crazy, regulate it see the order. And what's happened in Europe, and I've now been doing this for so long, it's, it's, the first question is always a regulatory question as opposed to what do I have to do to be a player? So I've seen this over and over again in my Google period where Google would invent something and then Europe, because Europe would be annoyed at us, they would try to regulate it rather than figure out a way to sort of build their own or compete in a different way. And it's ultimately a, it's a losing strategy. You're better off framing what can Europe do for AI that will really change the conversation. Right, so th listen mm -hmm. what you said. You talked about unreliability. Mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, how can we depend on it? How can we work on the yeah. infrastructure? Those are great questions for Europeans. European tech community is fantastic. Let's work on that. My concern, uh, and Estonia I think is, is generally uh, pretty good in this area, but some of the other European countries are not, that the culture in Brussels will ultimately stifle this, and that's to be avoided. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's exactly the question I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Can we get another one? Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to see the conversation going on. My question is... Um, yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Innocent. I come from Rwanda. Uh, my question is, um, what does the public sector need to do to embrace um, the capabilities of AI? And more specifically, when he, some of our countries that are still you know, following the digital trends, um, uh, where we lack uh, investments or even the technical capabilities, what are the key you know, practical action items that need to be done to ensure that, um, uh, that we achieve the benefits or we leverage what AI has to offer? And I'm asking this particularly because when you look at the public sector, uh, this is where um, the least capabilities are, investment right. and others. And this is more on both sides from a regulated point of view, but also the practical uh, point of view. I think you're doing a lot of things right. Um, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time in Rwanda, and I know your president very well. And I think you, you, you're, you're doing it so right, I, I hardly don't even want to give you a, a, any more advice. Just keep going. <laughs> um, it starts with, I think you have 40 or 50 million citizens. Maybe, maybe it's roughly that. Figure out a way to get everybody connected, and you've worked hard on that. 
using essentially low-end smartphones because the values are not very, uh, the prices are not very high. From those phones, try to get enough data that you can actually begin to do AI training. So the, the core issue is AI doesn't work unless you have lots of data to learn from. So what data is available within Rwanda to learn from? In the public sector especially, right? right. And, and in, whatever, in whatever section. Now that could be in national security, it could be in the police, it could be in healthcare. I would pick something that is of great concern of your citizens where you can get the data from their phones, from where they are, either their position or their behavior or so forth, get that data and then form a little company or a group within Rwanda, maybe work with your firm, because I know you're friends with them. And actually- I like how doing all my selling. <laughs> but, but, but it makes sense to me that you would, start, you would start with something that's relevant to the citizens, health, security, or education, and then use AI to make it better. And even a small improvement has huge implications because the size of your country. Thank you. My name is Lisa Pastor and I'm the National Cyber Director of Estonia. You mentioned both training data and human fallibility. To me, those two create the biggest paradox around AI. On the one hand, training data will have to be based on things we already know. Sure. So it includes the human errors and our AI will never be better than what we teach it. On the other hand, our current approach assumes a human in the loop, which therefore implies that the human is better than the AI. Mm -hmm. It makes less errors somehow. Given that very practical paradox, and putting your own answer back to you as a question, how do we win? How do we overcome that paradox? Uh, an outstanding comment and question. So, <clears throat> Uh, one of the criticisms of AI is that it's full of bias and it's simple because it learns from what humans do and humans are full of bias. So everyone says, oh my God, we can't fix that. But of course we can fix it. We can, if we know where the biases are, we can take the data and we can renormalize it to humans without those biases. In other words, we could take the real data and we could say, well, we don't like people who are prejudiced, for example which I, I certainly don't like people with prejudice, and we'll delete them, that data, from the data set, and then we'll get a synthetic data as if we had humans that don't have these biases. So that kind of technique works pretty well, right, for, for the normal day of operation. So an example would be people have discovered that judges are more uh, liberal in the morning and more harsh in the right. afternoon, right? Well, that's something you can change the data so if you make a synthetic recommendation judge, you can choose the morning and not the afternoon data. So all of those are pragmatic solutions to the problem. To me, the problem that I don't have a good answer is when the problem has to be resolved quicker than a human can. And I don't think we have an answer to that. I think we're going to have to be honest and say that we're gonna to have to accept some failures, obviously minimize them, in a situation which is faster than human reaction. Because you can't, there's not enough time for the human. It is always post-action. But I guess, as in the question and in your own comment before, I mean, some failures are sort of inevitable anyway, perhaps not, best not also not have a double standard against the machines versus the humans, right? Yeah, although I think humans are such that if the machine does it, will never forgive, whereas another human does it, will forgive them as being human. Right. I think this is a core problem. And there's nothing wrong with having high goals for what my, my industry mm -hmm. does, but I want to have people to understand that you will not get absolute perfection because of these issues. Absolutely. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Chris Burns. I'm the Chief Digital Development Officer for the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, we work in a lot of emerging countries uh, around the world, and uh, I suppose a follow-on to the gentleman from Rwanda, certainly Google has invested heavily on the African continent in particular, an AI lab in Accra, et cetera. And we think about uh, the workforce development aspect of that, perhaps the non-data, non-digital technology part of this. There's an upswell of innovation on the continent where you have Africans, local Africans solving local solutions. Digital literacy is still a challenge. How do we build up that digital literacy and that workforce development so that more Africans can embrace AI to solve local problems? Thank you. 
So 20 years ago, I made my first visit to Kenya, and I visited the computer science department. And you have these very, very capable faculty members. They run up and they say, we love Google. And I said, well, good. You know, I love Google, too. And they said, no, no, we really love Google. And I said, well, I really love Google, too. And they go, no, 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 we really, really, really love Google. And I go, why? And he said, we don't have textbooks. OK. Then all of a sudden, I understood what the problem was. I mean, how could you have a PhD in computer science without having a computer science PhD textbook? Right? Because they couldn't afford it. So that's when I began to understand what it took. So here's the simple model. You've got enormous talent in Africa. They're, they need some stuff. It starts with connectivity. It also starts with language, right, because of the local, the local languages. We worked hard to that, to do all of that. Much of Africa, what, and Google, what we did is we decided to do the fibers around Africa and then try to convince the governments, often whom, uh, and this is not a comment about Rwanda, but other countries, were relatively corrupt with respect to their PTTs. So we would try to convince them to run a fiber to the center of the city and then have a fiber ring around the city and then have basically Wi-Fi towers or uh, 4G towers at the time around. That seems to have largely happened. That's good. So the next thing is to create the, the databases that I'm describing to solve real problems. And these things always work best when you have a local problem where AI can learn the problem. And that's very specific to the country. But I will tell you, having done this now for 20 years, the talent is there and the connectivity is there. It's now a messaging, industrial, and frankly, a capital. They need capital. There's not enough capital in, in Africa. And this, cap this capital should be the easiest to get into because it's software. So it's very capital efficient to invest in these companies. Yeah. We can get one last question from the front, long waiting. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is uh, Kenneth Pugh, Senator from the Republic of Chile. With a few parliamentarians around the world in the uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute, we are trying to understand how to protect democracy and rule of state right. in the area of in artificial intelligence. Nowadays, uh, uh, a human right, the freedom of speech, is uh, what we must preserve. But that human right is for humans. It's not for artificial intelligence. Right. Then we have to, and we need, a good digital identity provided by government, not credential, username, and password. How this could be solved in order to have humans using that right and not artificial intelligence? Right. Thank you. Perfectly said. So <laughs> I think there are three short-term issues with AI. The first one has to do with biological databases and the access to them and the ability to build negative viruses. We haven't talked about that, but that's a real short-term threat. We've got to work on that. The second one is this military question about decision-making time. Right? We don't have a good answer to that. And the third one is your point. So whether it's protection of teenagers, especially teenage girls, but teenagers who are severely affected by being online or the effect that it's had on our political systems, Right? We've ended up in a situation where we got confused as to what free speech was. So you and I agree free speech is for humans. I am not in favor of free speech for computers. Right? I'm sorry to disappoint the computer constituencies. <laughs> I'm in favor of all humans. By the way, that me, that also includes President Trump, right? who I don't uh, agree with, but he's clearly human and flawed, but that's a separate discussion. Um, but we all are. So the problem here is really boosting. It's the distinction between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. Now, if I were a crazy American, which I might be, and I stood out in your Freedom Square and I started screaming, how much impact would I have? But let's say I had a megaphone that was loud enough that every citizen of Estonia could hear me, it would be very different. We, we've, we don't have a good way of understanding where that limit is. So the way I say is, is don't regulate speech, regulate the boosting of the speech. If you look at the DMA and the DSA in Europe, it doesn't do that. If you look in the, Euro in the US various laws, it doesn't do that. Perhaps your country, Chile, can figure out a good way to do this. But from this, as unfortunately, as always, time runs fast. <laughs> um, I know that you've been in sort of policy circles for about 10 years now, right? So you've, you've had to master this. So if you have to do like a three sentence takeaway pitch saying, what should those old folks here take away and do different tomorrow, start doing tomorrow? 
I would really like Estonia to have more, more reach for the high skills people that you need. Because you figured out in this little country to do something which is well above your weight, I want you to accelerate it. And the way to accelerate it is more money, more people, and it's, knowledge, it's the knowledge economy. So what can Estonia do? Be a leader in the, uh, the knowledge economy. That's where the future is, right? And it, shouldn't it be the case that the other smaller countries in Europe that are more nimble, right, can pull this off with Estonia as their, as their example? But if you jump beyond Estonia and just exactly about the transatlantic community, which largely is here as well, what would be your three sentences to them as takeaway? The, the, biggest, the biggest thing going on is going to be the development of this next layer of AI, which will largely be done in, in companies and in research labs. Europe is behind in this. It's really important that Europe take the necessary steps to, to fix it, and the answer is right now. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Keep coming We're back really to Dallin. Thank you, and congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.